his body. I think Freud really took up the advocacy of cocaine because first of all, first and primary, it had such a wonderful effect on him. I think if anyone's ever seen pictures of Freud, they see him as a kind of a depressed, morose looking individual, and certainly the euphoric uh, qualities of cocaine lifted his spirits. Unfortunately, Freud's cocaine experiments ended in disaster. Naively enthusiastic, impatient for his own success, he prescribed the drug to a close friend, Ernst von Fleischel Marxau, in hopes of weaning him from an agonizing morphine addiction. Instead, Fleischel Marxau developed a fatal addiction to cocaine. To make matters worse, another friend and fellow scientist, Carl Kohler, following Freud's own leads, discovered that cocaine could be used as an anesthetic for surgery of the eye. He, and not Freud, became famous overnight. Despite these experiences and the black eye they gave him in professional circles, Freud continued to use cocaine as a pick-me-up until 1895. One of the things that made him blind to its uh, negative properties was the fact that he really only used it intermittently and never became addicted to it. What he was really addicted to was his work. In 1885, Sigmund Freud was an unknown intern at the General Hospital of Vienna. His specialty was nervous diseases, a field that included hysteria and other eccentric disorders. But Freud chose it for strictly practical reasons. He was in a hurry to marry, and there were few doctors in the field. Mental illness was the backwater of 19th century medicine, both in terms of understanding and treatment. Before Freud, people were spun around in chairs that made them dizzy. People were doused with cold water. People were forced to wear chains. The most enlightened doctors of the day assumed that hysteria and related ailments were at root physical, caused by nerve damage or a lesion on the brain. Freud shared that view when he went to Paris in 1885 to study with one of the world's authorities on nervous disorders, a charismatic Frenchman, Jean-Martin Charcot. Charcot was conducting odd but fascinating experiments, putting hysterical patients under hypnosis. Experiments that turned Freud's ideas inside out and launched him on a lifelong exploration of the psyche. Diseases can be caused by ideas. That's what he got from Charcot. Charcot hypnotized people and Charcot proved that you can implant ideas into someone in a hypnotic state and produce a physical symptom. The key idea in Charcot was that it could be that their beliefs in some layer of the mind that figure very strongly in the kind of symptoms that the hysterics showed at the time. In other words, it's not just in the body, it's also in the mind. More specifically, a hidden part of the mind, what Charcot called the second mind, and what Freud eventually turned into the unconscious one of the defining concepts of the 20th century. On April 5th, 1886, just weeks after returning from Paris, Freud opened his own medical practice, renting a one-room office on the fringe of fashionable Vienna. He struggled to make ends meet and sometimes couldn't afford cab fare for a house call. Freud began his medical practice as a hypnotist. The famous Freudian couch comes from hypnosis. It was easier to put someone in a trance lying down. Inspired by Charcot, Freud hoped to get into his patient's second mind and end their hysteria through hypnotic suggestion. It didn't really work, but it was no less effective than the other therapies of the time, some of which Freud also employed. He tried the usual barrage of therapeutic remedies, the spa cures, they had electrotherapy, they had hydrotherapy, even the use of magnets. Freud was what was called a magnetizer, where he would practice on patients transferring symptoms from one side of the body to the other. None of it worked, and Freud was increasingly fascinated with the problem of why. He picked up a crucial clue from a colleague, Dr. Joseph Breuer. Breuer told Freud about an unusual patient, known in psychoanalytic history as Anna O, and an even more unusual treatment, the talking cure. 
Anna O is a very severe hysteric. She has contractures, she has paralyses, she has impairment of vision and speech, and Breuer starts to see her daily, and as she describes her symptoms, he becomes aware of the fact that when she tells him about the origin of a symptom, the symptom tends to disappear. It is the patient who coins the term the talking treatment, which becomes the basis of all psychotherapy. Still using hypnosis, Freud adopted this eccentric new treatment, talking with his patients about their symptoms, trying to uncover when and how they began. What he uncovered is still reverberating through Western culture. Patient after patient trace their hysteria back to traumatic childhood experiences involving sex. Sex, it seemed, was at the root of neurotic sickness. For a time, Freud believed that all hysteria stemmed from childhood sexual abuse. Eventually, he argued that it either came from real abuse or from a repressed and guilty childhood fantasy of sex. In either case, sex was at the core of the problem. In fact, sex was cropping up everywhere, even Freud's consulting room. His female patients, one after the next, were developing romantic feelings for their doctor. At the end of one session, a woman threw her arms around Freud and gave him a passionate kiss. Freud was highly aroused, as a scientist, and he pondered this new riddle. Here he was roughly 40, sexually inexperienced, and all of a sudden he's with a woman patient who throws her arms around him and wants a kiss. Now I think that many men in that circumstance might think the patient finds me attractive. She has fallen in love with me. But Freud didn't. Here he was in a sexually saturated clinical setting and he was not going to succumb to the sexuality, nor was he going to leave it. He was going to figure out a way how to stay there and work with the patient. Freud eventually realized that his patients were transferring passionate feelings for their parents onto him. The concept of transference became a crucial tool in psychotherapy. Ironically, while Freud's work life was saturated with issues of sex, his actual sex life was dwindling and threatening to make him neurotic. He married Martha at the age of 30 in 1886, and the two had six children in the next eight years. Freud wanted no more offspring, but he detested birth control, especially the then prevalent withdrawal method. His numerous male patients convinced him it was the primary cause of neurotic anxiety in men. He said in the 1890s, the only way in which a man cannot be neurotic is to have free and unfettered sexual intercourse with his mate, which meant no condoms, meant no coitus interruptus, it meant no masturbation. You know, if you did any of those things, you were going to wind up being neurotic. After the birth of Anna in 1895, Freud, the man who made libido a household word and singled out sex as a primary force in the human psyche, gave up sex for a number of years. Freud talked about libido, and I don't think early on one would say that he had a low libido. It, you could say, I mean, one has a sense maybe he pooed out early or that he sublimated it very well. And I think that he allowed for people to sublimate in their work and he was passionately involved in his work. Increasingly, for Freud, work was his passion. The ambitious golden boy was caught up in the scientific sleuthing of a lifetime, piecing together revolutionary ideas about dreams, the unconscious, and sexuality into a radical new conception of the mind. A man like me cannot live without a hobby horse a consuming passion, a tyrant. I have found my tyrant, and in his service, I know no limits. My tyrant is psychology. Sigmund Freud.